Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good day to Sir Awi and all our friends. We are from Group 2 and today we are presenting about three famous reformists, Afghani, Abdul and Rashid Ridha. So my name is Amira Shohada binti Sharuddin with metric number of 1812322 and before we going any further, let me explain first the brief overview of these three reformists. Who are these people and where did they came from? So the first one is Jamal Adin al-Afghani or famously known as al-Afghani. He was born in Asadabad, Iran in 1838 and died in Istanbul, Turkey in 1897. While the second one is Muhammad Abdu who was born in Egypt in 1849 and died in Alexandria in 1905. And the third one we have Rashid Rida, the youngest of the three uh, reformists. He was born in Al-Kalamwit. Ottoman Syria in 1865 and died in Egypt at 1935. And all these three scholars were famous reformists who lived in the 19th century and 20th century. So what happened in the 19th and 20th century? Well, during these centuries, there was a significant Islamic reformation movement that happened because the 19th and 20th century was the age of Western domination and colonialism where the Western forces have become very strong and your ideologies and influence were widely spread all around the world. It was during this time as well where the Islamic countries had become weakened and thus it was the period of the fall of the Islamic Caliphate. And all this Western domination, weakened Islamic power and influence has resulted in the rise of Islamic reformists who sought to bring back Muslims' unity and glory. And among the reformists were Afghani, Abdul, and Rashid Rida. Well, all these three reformists were pretty much related, especially because they were students of one another, like Abdul was the student of Afghani, while Rashid Uda was student of Abdul. So their movement or their Islamic reformation actually have common goals and also similar characteristics. Some of the common goals are firstly, the pan-Islamism. What is pan-Islamism? Pan-Islamism is actually an ideology which they want to unite all the Muslims all around the world and the one single identity to resist colonialism or the Western powers. It was pioneered by Afghani and advocated more by the others after him. While the second one is, they were anti-Western imperialism. Like I've said before, they were living in the era of Western colonialism and domination that happened in many Muslim countries. Hence why their ideologies were mostly similar to work against the Western imperialism or Western influence that corrupt the Muslim society or Muslim countries. Next, the third one is about modernism. This was especially advocated by Muhammad Abdul. They brought the ideas regarding modernism and wanted the Muslim to embrace the modern sciences as well. Because during this time, Muslim world was in backwardness. Hence why they pointed out the importance of modernism as well as still following the root of Islam closely. Lastly, the fourth one is all three of them had one bit similarity, which they used politics education, and journalism as the medium to spread their ideologies all around the Muslim world, and most of their words were very, very effective. Then, as for the location, all of these reformists have went to a lot of countries, and they were at some point where their path crossed each other and lengthened their reformation from one generation to another. For Jamal the Afghani, he went to a lot of countries. He went to Iran, Iraq, India, Afghanistan, Mecca, Turkey, Egypt, Paris, Russia, England. While for Mama Abdul, he was mainly in Cairo, Egypt. But he also went to like Ottoman, Lebanon, Paris, France, Britain, and other European countries. So where did they meet? Afghani met Abdul during his eight-year stay in Egypt. And it was during that time where Abdul became his student. Abdul also uh, worked together with Afghani in Paris years after that. Then for Rashid Rida, he didn't really travel a lot. He mainly in Syria. He also went to Lebanon, Egypt, and Ottoman. Rashid Rida firstly met Abdul in Lebanon in the 1880s, but it was in 1897 where Rashid Rida decided to go to Cairo to fully study under Muhammad Abdul. Moreover, regarding the time period, 
their information had been spread throughout the 19th and 20th century. As you can see in the timeline where Afghani was born in 1838 was in 19th century and then Abdul also was born in 1849 and in 1865 Rashid Udaq was born and it was in 1870s where Abdul met Afghani in Egypt and Abdul became a student but then in 1897, Afghani died before Rashid Rida even had the opportunity to meet him. So right after Afghani's death, Rashid Rida went to Egypt to meet Abdul and become his students. And then uh, eight years after that, Abdul died and it was in the mid of 20th century where Rashid Rida died. So we can see how their life journey uh, was spread throughout the 19th and 20th century, which make all the uh, reformation possible in this uh, in these two centuries so that's all for the overview of these three reformers next i will pass the floor to my group mates to explain about their biographical backgrounds their roles and also the impact of their thoughts we will start with jamaluddin al-afghani and then muhammad abdul and lastly we will end with rashid reda so i will pass the floor to my friend thank you Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Dia Humari Zainuddin with metric number 1810060. In this occasion, I will be presenting the first report, reformist, which is Jamaluddin al-Afghani. Alright, so move on to his background. Jamaluddin al-Afghani, or his full name is Jamal al-Din al-Afghani as Sayyid Muhammad ibn Safdar al Hussein. His birth was dispute. He himself claimed that he was born in the village of Asadabad near Kabul, Afghanistan. Yet scholars commonly agree that he was born in the family of Sayyids or descendant of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad of Asadabad in 1838 Persia or now well known as Iran. He died in Istanbul, Turkey on March 1897. Uh, some people so say that he was supposed to be Shia in Iran by origin, but he never been seen to spread the Shi'i to the people. Jamal al-Afghani Af also a thinker and politician and well known as one of the essential supporter of the pan-Islamism. His education began at home until he was 10 years old and after that he attended school, he attended school in Qazafin and Tehran. He spent his teen studied theology and Islamic philosophy in Karbala and Najaf, which is the center of Shi'i learning in Iraq. And in 1855, Afghani, in the age of 17, traveled to India. And here is the moment where Afghani became familiar with British imperialism or British domination and observed how Muslims in India were gradually discriminated against such aspect like gaining government's job, participating in religious activity, even obtaining education matter. So from India, Al-Afghani then traveled to Mecca and then returned to Karbala and Najaf once more and remained there until 1865. And in the following year, in 1866, Al-Afghani arrived at Afghanistan and received access to the Amir Muhammad Azam Khan. Muhammad Azam Khan was the military ruler of Kandahar under those Muhammad Khan. And in politics, Al Afghani often advised Azam, the Afghanistan king, to ally himself with Russia to prevent the steady network movement from the British across the Punjab. But then he was expelled because he was a foreigner. And then he went to Cairo, Egypt. And then in 1869, he went to Istanbul, Turkey. And again, with his intelligence and charismatic personality, he had the access to the Allied power. Over there, he became a lecturer in New University and taught people his unorthodox idea. Afghani spent his whole life moved from one country to another and influenced many a light ruler. In 1869, he traveled to Istanbul and expecting to be named the Sultan's confidant. Despite to be the Sultan's confidant, he was expelled from Turkey because of the confrontation of ulama with him, which too volatile for Abdulaziz to support. 
Al Afghani then returned to Egypt in 1871 to pursue his teaching and his dream to create a pan Islamic nation that free from British domination. Afghani also traveled to London, then he proceeded to Paris, French, where over there he engaged by, uh, with a French philosopher named Ernest Renan in a debate on the position of scientific discovery in Islam. So, in here, in this debate, Ernest Renan and the other European scholars thought that Islam, that the Muslim, was behind them, was behind the European in terms of science. And in this occasion, Afghani strengthening them that Islam has discovered so many scientific discoveries before them. Afghani's role in the Muslim world is very essential. Afghani is frequently depicted as quite possibly the most conspicuous Islamic political pioneers and scholars of the 19th century. He really, really concerned about the Islamic principles in every aspect in life. And also with another Islamic scholar, Muhammad Abdu, he introduced an interpretation of Islam which called for modernization and education while still again encouraging the Islamic principles. He was worried about the correct the coercion of the Muslim world by Western frontier forces, and he made the freedom, autonomy, and solidarity of the Islamic world one of the significant points of his life. So one of his huge work in life is to prevent from the British domination. His unique ability, which is to influence the upper classes and always emphasize the unity of Muslim, had influenced many reforms, for instance, Egypt's national movement, Turkey's Tanzimat reforms, as well as Iran's constitutional and lastly, Islamic revolutions. As I had mentioned earlier, Afghani is a philosopher and politician who promoted the concept of unity of Muslim against British. His whole life, he tried to establish a very solid block against Western imperialism or from the European domination. He also one of the very influential supporters of the pan-Islamic movement. Besides, Afghani also promoted political activism, asking his student to publish political newspaper, while he himself gave speeches and headed a secret society, which said to be a Freemasonate, that involved in reformist activities. He also made some books. For instance, The Refutation of the Materialists, dated 1881. This book consisted mainly of the collecting and publishing of Afghani speeches that includes his growing interest in social conciseness, modernism, and rational thinking. Another works of him is on the revolutionary journal in Arabic called Al Urwat al Wuthko in association with his student Muhammad Abduh in the 1970s. This magazine published on several issues and regarded as the champion of the pan Islamism and has been spread to many Muslim world. Lastly, is Makalat Eja Malie and Sir Renan, which is wrote in various other newspapers and magazines in a few countries. In order to operate his mission, which is to unite the Muslim community and prevent the Muslim from the European domination, there are some challenges he faced, which is the masses of ignorance and poverty among the Muslim, and they have no good education, and also he himself unable to materialize his dream due to some reasons. First, Afghani is too focused on putting trust and goodwill to the Muslim allied ruler and less attention to the people of the Middle East. He had traveled around the world to many countries to get attention from the ruler of the country but not the people. Second, he used religion to achieve political aims and assuming that the world ruler acted independently of one another as of the Khalif. And lastly, he often bothered the ruler by lecturing them. Despite talking about Afghanis' challenges, he also had contributed something, many things, to modern Islam. First, Afghanis' hostility toward British rule in the Muslim land was the moving force behind all Afghani life and works. 
in order keeping his emphasis on anti-imperialism and his desire to maintain the Muslim country's independence, al Afghani emphasized on practical aspect of reform and self-improvement like technical and scientific education. al Afghani was one of the first Muslim figures to participate in many forms of political reform. He spoke publicly, published newspaper, and encouraged his followers to do so. Even he is not the first who promoted the idea, but he was extremely very good at spreading the messages. His ideas still apply to those who support the political reform who emphasize the Islamic principles. Despite his political reforms, Afghani at the end focuses more on educational matter for the people. Alright, thank you very much. That's all for my part and I will pass to the next presenter. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Wan Siti Najwa and now we will move to the second figure which is Muhammad Abdu. First, let's look into the background of Muhammad Abdu himself. He was born in 1849 near Nile Delta area of Egypt and died in July 1905 near Alexandria at the age of 56. His early education was of course started at home by his parents and later he enrolled in Ahmadi Mosque School in Tanta and continue, further continue his study at Al-Azhar University in Cairo in which he got the title of Alim. Among the professions of Muhammad Abdul throughout his lifetime were teacher, jurist in native court as well as the Mufti of Egypt. He was appointed as teacher in several institutions including Darul Ulum, Khaiva School of Languages Egypt and also Madrasa of Sulaimaniyah Beirut. Muhammad Abdul was first introduced to al Afghani when he was in Egypt and Muhammad Abdul was also considered as among the loyal students of al Afghani. Muhammad Abdul was once exiled from Egypt because he was accused of being involved with the Urabi revolt. But later he moved to Paris and once again he met Al-Afghani there, whom was also exiled long before Muhammad Abdul at Paris. Both of them successfully established a society named Jam'iyat al urwad al wufqa that aimed to unite the Muslim against the colonialism. Aside from that, the society also published an Arabic magazine with the same title of the society's name but as expected. It was banned due to the influence it had in calling the people for unity and for against the colonial power. Muhammad Abdul also learned the French language in order to maximize the benefits from what's written in that, in that particular language. Although he couldn't master it, he referred to lots of literature works through translation version. Okay, now let's move to the role of Muhammad Abdul. And from here, we can see that it can be divided into three aspects, which is the social, economy and politics. Let's look on the social face. Muhammad Abdul, he criticized the educational system because according to him, the objective of learning is not to serve the government. The final objective of learning, training or the education itself in general was not meant to work for the European. This is considering on how the schools during that time was established and were mainly centered on European education and it was only open for those of the elite class children. Muhammad Abdul stated that the purpose of the education is to improve their skills and to prepare the students for the future in order for them to do their work within their own specializations. And education is also to teach them, to train them on how to live an honest and a skillful life. Muhammad Abdul also support for gender equality. This is especially pertaining on women's rights because during that time, women were being discriminately treated and Muhammad Abdul believed that women shouldn't be treated lower than men. Instead, everyone should be treated the same. Men or women should be treated the same and be given the same opportunity either in education, works or other daily activities. Now, let's move to the economy. Egypt during that time was very well known for their agriculture activities. But according to Mama Abdul, despite that well-knownness, Egypt during that time was in the state of poverty. But what does it mean by poverty here? Poverty here means that those who manage the crops or those who manage these agriculture activities, they were not even trying to develop the practices. They were not even trying to develop the activities. Because it can be seen, even after years of it being introduced, they still been using, they keep on using the old technique without the need to improve or even innovate machines in order to ease the process. In here, we can see that Muhammad Abdul, he himself wants the people to move forward, to not stuck on the traditional way of agriculture. Aside from showing effort to develop the agriculture activities, natural resources also need to be exploited. Not in the excessive way, but 
at least they need to make use of natural resources for their own benefit, for the benefit of the land, for the benefit of Egypt themselves. And then the involvement of people here, both with their thinking and also the manpower. They need to hire workers and also make an effort to develop the old technique is what Muhammad Abdul tried to explain of the poverty. Like what written on the slide, it's just like the summarized version of what Muhammad Abdul think of the poverty is that the real poverty is the lack of utilised natural resources, human rationality and developed human resources in the world. So it's not the same as what we understood poverty as is in today. This is the poverty in the view of Muhammad Abdul. And the economy also, Muhammad Abdul, he defined the term economy. According to him, economy consists of two elements, which are earning and spending. Earning and spending is also to ensure the continuous cycle of money within the society. Because in here, we need to see that the rich, we need to see and we need to analyze that the rich, they only consist of minority part of the society. Thus, it is very important for them to spend their money, of course, as it can indirectly help those in needs to earn their living. People cannot spend their money excessively, nor at the same time cannot keep the money by themselves. So, in between misers and extravagant, Muhammad Abdul, he advised the people to be at the middle, to spend and to earn at the same time. And the last one is politics. He promotes the concept of wataniyah and at the same time also uphold the idea of pan-Islamism. Muhammad Abdul promotes the concept of wataniyah in order to unite the people of Egypt, regardless of races and religion, with the objective to fight against the control of European power towards them. Or in another word, is the national unity. That's why under this Watania concept, under the unity of Watania, he managed to unite the Christian and also the Jews under the same objective. Aside from that, we can also see his view and also expectations on the government, like how it should be done in order for the government and the country itself to run smoothly. First one, demanding the power limitation of the ruler. According to him, the ruler need to consult the member of the parliament first before making any decisions. This is in order to avoid any tyrannical ruling by the ruler themselves. Second, the ruler need to be just and fulfilling the people's need. And the last one, Muhammad Abdul, he strongly rejected any form of military government because according to him, military government, any form of military government, they can never serve the people and will only do things in line with their desire as militants. And this wrap up the role of Muhammad Abdul in three aspects, which is social, economic and politics. Now we will move to the impacts of Muhammad Abdul, which can be categorized into three. First, the modernization of Egypt. Second, modernization of Islamic education. Third, broaden the meaning of jihad for advocating human rights. And the last one, fatwa on contemporary issues. Now let's look on the first one, modernization of Egypt. He believed that everything must be based on a Quran and a Sunnah. To start the modernization of Egypt in every aspect, Muhammad Abdul, he strongly uphold that religion must be on the front line of everything because the backwardness of the Muslim at that time, it was mainly due to the ignorance and also the lack of understanding towards the religion itself. Thus, this explains on why he tried his very best to make a change on the understanding of the people to be accordance with the reality of the world or also known as Muqiyah, the reality, without putting aside Al-Qur'an and As-Sunnah from the modernization itself. Hence, it can be concluded that modernization is possible with both Al-Qur'an and As-Sunnah in line. There's no such story on how it will go wrong as long as they fully understood the correlation of it. Under the modernization of EG also, instead of imitation, he was more inclined on the concept of borrowing from the European. Mama Abdul, he studied and he also analyzed the European way of thinking before he can, it's not fully, but before he adapting it into the society instead of just copying every single actions and the top of them. This one for the modernization of Egypt. Moving to the second one, modernization of Islamic education. Muhammad Abdul, he was the founder of Society of Islamic Propaganda in Al-Azhar that functioned to challenge the missionary movement of Christianity and among the members of this society is uh, also a well-known reformist which is Rashid Rida and he was also elected as the president of Al Jamiyat Al Khairiyat Al Islamiyah the Islamic Charitable Society that functioned to establish more schools and training center 
in order to promote education and other social cultural services as well to the people. They want to open more school because, as mentioned before, the education institution that was created by the British was only meant for the elite class children and they only impose the British educational syllabus to the children. So they want to establish more school in order for more people to get the education that they deserve. And the last one under the modernization of Islamic education is rejected the practice of taklid and encouraged ijtihad. Muhammad Abdul, he wants the Muslim to exercise their own ijtihad that can produce their own interpretation. In here, we need to understand the very core concern of Muhammad Abdul in whereby Egypt at that time was surrounded with a conservative thoughts and he previously, as I mentioned, he wants the people to understand the religion, the, the understanding of the religion to be accordance with the current world reality. Hence, by gatekeeping the religion, it is hard to liberate the people from the old practice. Therefore, Muhammad Abdul was propagating the act of ijtihad in order for the Muslim to understand the religion more and the religion relevancy to the reality. The third one is broaden the meaning of jihad. Jihad fi sabilillah, according to Muhammad Abdul, is very wide because it includes everything that may contribute to the betterment of public interest for the masalihal ummah. This indirectly opened more way for the people to contribute to the din, to the religion, instead of the typical understanding that defines jihad as war in the battlefield. Uh, the fourth one is advocating human rights. This is especially for education and women. Like previously mentioned, for education, through the al jamiyat al Khariyat al islamiyah the Islamic Charitable Society that open way for more people to get the education they deserve. And the last one, fatwa on temporary issue. This is accordance with the current reality. As we are well aware on how Mama Abdul, he wants the people to think, he wants the people to analyze the situation or in, in other words, he wants the people to make their own ijtihad. So he, as a mufti of Egypt, he gave fatwa in accordance with the current reality, with the current situation. So people might think that it is a bid'ah because temporary issue, right? It is something new. So people are reluctant to to make a decision. It is permissible or not, is uh, Sharia compliance or not. So the fatwa that he gave was almost an eye-opener for the people because he once discussed on the topic of insurance. Insurance is something new, right? So people was hesitated. It is okay. Is insurance okay? So, Mama Abdul, he gave the fatwa that insurance is permissible. But it is normal for something new to the norm. It will result on another rising problem. So, in this insurance case, the new rising matter is regarding riba. But it was also well explained by Mama Abdul. But in general, the idea is that he gave the fatwa in line with the current situation. As a mufti of Egypt, he actually influenced, he encouraged the people to move forwards and not to stick on their traditional way of thinking, their conservative way of thinking because Islam is indeed a dynamic. It moves forward in line with the reality. So from my reading on one of the articles related to Muhammad Abdul, there is one author who said that when Muhammad Abdul came back to Egypt after he was exiled, he was no longer the revolutionary and the enemy of the European instead. He was the one that adapting their way, adapting the European way in modernizing uh, Egypt. I think it is very interesting to discuss about this because if I were to put myself in Mom Abdul's shoes, if I see something on the European side that can benefit me or that can benefit my country, then why not I borrow that? Why not I borrow that elements to modernize my country? And it's not even against the religions, right? So I think it's not necessary for Muhammad Abdul to make a wall between him and the European as long as they benefit from it and Islam is not against what were brought by the European. So uh, in here also we can see that Muhammad Abdul, he was not blindly follow what brought by the, by the European but instead he extract the discipline, he extract the essence of uh, what brought by the European and he analyze it before adapting into the society. That's all from me on Muhammad Abdul. Now I will pass on to my friend to explain on Rashid Rida. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Hasmiza, metric number 1810054. I will be presenting on Rashid Rida's biography, his role as a reformist and the impact of his reform ideas. 
First of all, I will share and explain about biographical background of Rashid Rida. Alright, Rashid Rida's full name is Muhammad Rashid bin Ali Rida bin Muhammad Shamsuddin bin Muhammad Baharuddin bin Mullah Ali Khalifa. So, there were two accounts of his birth date, whether he was born on 23rd of September 1865 or on 18th October 1865. Rashid Rida was born in Al-Qalamun, Beirut Vilayat in Ottoman Syria, which is now located at Lebanon. After 70 years, he died on 22nd of August 1935. Rashid Rida started his education at Kutab, which is a traditional Quranic school in his village. Then he received education in Orthodox Islamic subjects, which is a common form of Muslim education, and he also received education in arithmetic. Later, he was sent to Rushdia National Primary School in Tripoli, Turkey, after graduating. There, he studied Arabic grammar, algebra, geography basics, Islamic belief, Islamic rituals, and Turkish. Um, unfortunately, he dropped out after a year because the majority of the classes were taught in Turkish. So, after dropping out, Rashid Rida then studied at the National Islamic School or Al Madrasa Al Wataniya Al Islamiya, which was founded by Sheikh Hussein Al Jizr. There, he learned both traditional Muslim theology and some secular subjects or uh, modern subjects like European languages, mathematics, and also philosophy. Along with his education there or after he graduated, he was exposed to the writings of Muhammad Abduh and Al-Afghani in the short-lived pan-Islamic anti-colonialist journal Al-Urwa Al-Budka, which was published in Paris in 1884. Rashid Rida used their writings to criticize the ulama during his time. Okay, moving on to Rashid Rida's role and what did he propagate during his life. Basically, Rashid Rida called for variety forms or of reform ideas in order to maintain Muslims' unity. In my opinion, based on my research and readings, Rashid Rida's reform were basically more concentrated on educational reform which will be explained later on. This was because during his time, Muslims faced different reality, mainly uh, by the colonization by the West. Secondly, Rida's central concept was of moderate reforms. I believe that he did not support the idea of revolution or immediate change, so he emphasized a step-by-step reform. As such, he involved himself in pan-Arabism and pan-Islamist. This step was taken because he believed that it could help him to protect and free Muslims from colonization by the West. Thirdly, he wanted to revive the idea of caliphate and its importance to the Muslim community cohesion as he was Present during the fall of Ottoman Caliphate, he wanted to restore the Caliphate in Mecca as Mujtahid and Supreme Shura Council as the key elements of the Caliphate. He wanted to restore the Caliphate as he witnessed the incompetence of Sultan Abdul Hamid who had lost at the hand of the young Turks. In addition, he believed that um, the caliphate should be in the hands of the Arab, not the Turks, because he thinks that the Turks were not qualified enough to lead the caliphate. So this led to the fourth point where he advocated for ijtihad and logic, as well as the acceptance of Western work ethic values. In my opinion, or um, in my point of view, since Rashid was present when the Islamic Caliphate fell apart, it is safe to say that he obtained a lot from his travels in Europe where he saw Western dominance and that the synthesis of these two experiences sealed his advocacy to follow some of Europe's advancement. So next, he merged religious teachings with uh, modern education. Then he emphasized the need to reform of Islam by adopting Western scientific learning and using ijtihad or independent, independent reasoning to interpret Islamic law. 
Sixth point is he tried to create a completely modernized Islamic state, but it must be based on Sharia. This was because the support must not be based on secular ideas like what that had been imposed by Mustafa Kemal Atatuk when he used an aggressive secular secularization process upon Muslim society and imposed radical secularization command to laicity, which is the French element of secularization. As we all know, it deeply served to disestablish Islam and to limit its powers to matters of beliefs and practice. Last point or the seventh point is Rashid Rida's progress through educational reform which um, I promised to explain before. So it was about the importance of political system and political state to have educational reform. In this essence, as he saw er- European dominance over Muslims, he attributed to their inability to master the sciences, establish organized political structures, and limit their government's influence. He claimed that if Muslims do not learn the commendable qualities of Western civilization, such as science, uh, technological skills, and wealth, there will be no political changes or or freedom for the Muslims. Alright, let us now move on to what impact did Rashid Rida had brought. First is about his works t- titled Al Manar, where this was the heart of Muslim intellectual movement. So Al Manar pays close attention of the medieval and modern Islamic facts, thus it gives the Muslims solid understanding of Rida's project or what he's been fighting for. Next is economic impact, where he had applied Islam's sacred law to modern financial instruments. As such, he was influenced not only by Islamic heritage, but also the French Enlightenment and economists, such as Francois Quisnay. In addition, the printing of Rashid Rida's works contributed much in Egypt's economy, which his works were printed in Matba'ah al-Manar, which it was one of the centers and the most important printing press in Egypt and Muslim world at, at the time. Apart from that, it also has the role of publishing books that are Salaf-oriented towards guiding the community to understand the teachings of Islam. Third is the transformation from empire politics to nation-state politics rather than ideological shift. Next, he emphasized on the importance of religious freedom which he claimed that it is the most basic Islamic concept and nothing can abrogate it. This was expressed in his Tafsir al-Manar and he believed that everyone has a right to believe anything um, they believe freely and they could express their religion based on their beliefs. So every religion can live together and respect each other. It has been the basic Islamic it has been the basic Islamic principles that can bring peace and rahmat for for the universe. Fifth or the last point is Rida's work had been regarded as a vehicle for da'wah to Muslim community throughout ages. So his work is like a a reflection of the thoughts of Islam and Tajdid that is ingrained or deep rooted in him. So that's all from me, and I will pass the floor back to Amira Shohada. Hello and Assalamualaikum. Hi, it's me again, Amira Shohada, and now I will talk about their reformist list of works and also their legacies. All these reformists have produced a lot of prominent publications that spread all around the Muslim world. So let's take a look at some of their works. The first one is Al Afghani. His most famous publication work was Al Uwat Al Hukka, or the English title is The Famous Point. Uh, he published it in 1884. It was actually his work with, uh, together with his most devoted students named Muhammad Abdul. It was published for several months in order to spread his pan-Islamism ideology to the Muslims. Well, the second one is Arat ala al-Dahri, or the English translation is the refutation of the materialist. Uh, it was his work that which he attacked the pro-British ideologies brought by Said Ahmed Han. Uh, and others, he also wrote in various other newspapers and magazines in uh, several countries like Makarat, Ijamalia, 
uh, he wrote several articles in it and also a book titled as to Renance and more. As for Mama Abdul, he also has a lot of works and publication. Like I've said before, uh, Al Uwaj Al Wufka is one of his most famous publications that he wrote together with Afghani and uh, he also wrote several articles in Al Journal. Mama Abdul also have experiences in government and law. He was the chief editor of the official gazettes of Egypt called Waka'i al Misriya uh, in 1880. He also wrote several books, for example, Risala al Tawhid, The Treatise on the Oneness of God, Risala al Warida, Treatise of Mystical Inspiration. Also, one of his most significant works is actually Tafsir al Manar, uh, interpretation of Al Quran. But unfortunately, he died before finishing this one. So one of his most devoted students actually helped continue this work. That student was actually Rashid Rida, our third reformist in our presentation today. So Rashid Rida continued Abdul's work and he published it under the name of Tafsir Al-Quran Al-Hakim. It was actually also called as Tafsir Al-Manar. He continued and also finished the publication and publish it. Uh, meanwhile, his other work like al Manar was actually his most significant work because he wrote this magazine, al Manar, uh, The Lighthouse was a magazine that he published throughout his whole life. Uh, first, uh, at the first period, it was weekly magazine but then it was monthly until the end of his life. And from the magazine, he would compile several articles on journals in it into a few books such as the Muhammadan Revelation, Tari al Usta al Imam al Sheikh Muhammad Abdul, uh, the biography of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul that he wrote himself, then books like Al Wahhabiyun wa Hijaz about the Wahhabis and Hijaz, Al Khilafah wa Imama al Usma, the Caliphate or the Supreme Imam and more. So he was one of the most prolific writer of this time. So, without any doubt, all these reformists have left a significant legacy and a lot of contributions to the next, next, and the newer generation. As for the first one, Al Afghani, Jamaluddin Al Afghani was the pioneer of the pan Islamism movement. He managed to advocate uh, the idea of the unity of Muslims, the pan Islamism, and also advocate the idea of anti Western imperialism to the Muslims of, uh, during his time. He also had inspired a lot of Muslims and people all around the world to work against the Western domination. Some of students like Muhammad Abdul and also decent like uh, students of his student like Rashid Rida. Then uh, we have Muhammad Abdul. Muhammad Abdul was so influential as a reformist. He has uh, highly contributed to the modernism and also reformism aspect of Islamic education and laws in Egypt and other countries to this day. Then last but not least, we have Rashid Rida. Rashid Rida's idea became the foundation for Islamic Brotherhood, a Muslim institution which founded by Hassan al-Banna and also his ideas regarding the significance of Muslim Caliphate also was prominent because uh, compared to the ideas, Rashid Rida himself witnessed the fallen of the Muslim Caliphate and this contributed to the development of his ideologies. With that, it marks the end of our presentation today. So it has been a very long journey uh, through this presentation. We can see all the reformists, works, thoughts, and more. So in conclusion, what can we say that there are so many things that we can learn from all these reformists, Jamal the Afghani, Mama Abdul, and Rashid Rida. There are so many life lessons and some of the lessons that uh, young generation, uh, like students today, can learn from them are uh, for example, their high spirit in fighting Western imperialism to fight the Western domination and also their influence that can corrupt Muslim and also while trying to unite and strengthen Muslim and these high spirits can be exemplified uh, by young generation today. We also can see how they try to bring back Muslims to the original teaching of Islam while engaging with the modernism element which means that we cannot escape from the modernism so they try to you know balance between the modern sciences and also the Islamic teaching the true Islamic teaching and uh, this reformation was very important uh, in these centuries and we can see all the contributions until today so I think that's all from us thank you so much for hearing our presentation and have a blessed Ramadan. Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you.